Okay. So by and large, the uh, resumes were very well done. Uh, the two most common uh, things I wrote down on the resumes were make sure that your bullet points at the top match what you're actually saying throughout the rest of the resume. So example, if you say, I am a design engineer with four years of experience, it should, I should be able to somehow either going through your projects in your education or what's listed in your actual job should add up to four years, right? So make sure you do that so if you, you missed that. Also, uh, the other main criticism I wrote on a lot of it is past, you'll see something to the effect of past projects. So what I want you to do is I want you to think back through your courses you know, that you did, whether it's coding projects, some sort of project where you had to do some sort of engineering or come up with a solution. You, you've all had one of those at this point, right? So you should be taking credit for that. You spent two months, three months working on it, right? That's two months or, well, somebody hopefully spent two months or three months working on it. Um, <laughs> all right, so... But it, it counts because you spent the whole semester learning what you needed to learn to get to the point to complete that project, right? So that counts as experience. So when you go back through, um, make sure that you list that. Get credit for it. You did it. You earned it. You paid the tuition or your parents paid the tuition, right? Please don't say no to that. <laughs> <laughs> I stole tuition. <laughs> um, but you get the right idea. What I, I the, what I'm trying to encourage you to do is, I, I understand, especially if you're the type of person where you don't like bragging about yourself, it can be very difficult to write a resume. And sometimes I want you to actually think like, okay, would you change the mentality slightly? I earned that, therefore I should put I should put it down so that way I can continue to earn more in the future. And the third thing, um, depending on what you wrote, I may have made a comment to the effect of, um, try to eliminate as much high school stuff as possible. Um, think of it this way. You know, how many of you uh, bought a high school class ring? And then how many times in the moment you got to college you stopped wearing it? Because no one really cared anymore, right? Kind of the same thing with jobs. Like if you're trying to get a, a real like professional type job, um, they're going to care more about what you did in college and more of your like job experience. Uh, if you did certain things in high school... Uh, that somehow demonstrated that you're capable to do the job, which is ultimately what the person looking at a resume cares about, then include it. Otherwise, if you're just saying I was in, uh, if I was in National Honor Society, um, okay, uh, did you do anything with the National Honor Society group that showed that you can organize or complete tasks? Th those kind of things. You see the difference? That makes sense. Yes. Well, the one thing like we haven't had a lot of classes with big. Right. Mm -hmm. But I, I, so to, to answer that question, because I did see that a lot. So the, the, the uh, common uh, concern is um, if you have don't have much experience, how do you get experience? Right. So what you need to do is put your best foot forward in that case. So you you have what you have right now. You have high, you've completed high school. You've completed about a year and a half, two years of college. You've done something, right? You wrote some map. If you you've all written MATLAB or Java code, right? And you had to accomplish a task. So say that you accomplish that task. It's something. It's better than nothing, right? Uh, also, you know, un unload all the bullets in your. That's not, that's not a good analogy. Um, <coughs> no, I mean for for obvious reasons, it's a bad analogy. Um, basically, don't leave leave no stone unturned. Is that a better way of putting it? Um, don't you, you never know if it's like if you're trying to get an internship and the internship, the whole goal is we want to find somebody we can train. They know that you don't have a ton of experience. So what you want to do is you want to say, all right, I you, at the top, you're listing your <coughs> what t tools and tasks you you can do like, you know, Java, you're going to. You're going to learn a little more C today. You'll know System C and Verilog by the end of this semester. Um, you want to start putting forth what it is that you have done. So if you put, like I wrote a uh, Java, and some people actually did this and did it really well, you know, wrote a Java program that you know, was able to search a binary search tree. Okay, so what does that actually mean? 
So you've demonstrated that you have a, a basic understanding of algorithms, which means you know how to problem solve. That means you are actually able to complete your task. And you, in that case, you might actually have some code samples. When you work on projects, keep, keep your code. Because sometimes a lot of jobs will actually ask you, do you have any code samples to demonstrate that you're good? Right? Now, the difference is, and this is something from uh, dealing with this from a prof prof uh, professor perspective, is keep your code, but keep your code safe. Keep your code away from other people. Because what happens, let's say you, you work on your project at the end of the semester for me, and Eli does a really good job, and he creates a professional website. And I'm coming up with a theory because I've seen this happen in the past, but not Eli. So Eli posts his code on there because he wants job the people who, uh, who are trying to hire him to see that he's competent. But I'm a professor. I give the same project next semester. Student X, who is super desperate and hasn't started the project yet, dude, Mar, Google, 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 I happen to find Eli's website. Well, guess what? Student X, student Y, student Z are all desperate, and they all find the same website. I run plagiarism detection. I find that they're doing, and then what do you think these three students are doing? They're desperate. I, I got to do anything. Well, okay, who where'd you find it? Eli Carson. <laughs> and now I have to like, call Eli. Hey, Eli. Come on, man. Take your code down. Right? That happened when I was uh, teaching operating systems at the University of South Florida. We had 70 students in that class. All six of them thought they were, six of these students thought they were being cute and clever. They all found the same code. Five of them didn't even bother to change the comments. So I knew precisely where they found the code. I'm like, yeah, your name is Greg. <laughs> your name is Sarah. That's very silly. Um, but you get the idea. So basically, you want to keep your code. Uh, but I, I realized by saying keeping that code, I could have caused problems. So keep your code, but make sure that you don't get you know nasty calls from angry professors in the future, right? Um, Anything else about resumes? Okay, so that's basically, so this for the second exam, it'll be a lot easier just making those minor tweaks. Um, I think a lot of you can uh, do that this weekend because there's a job fair coming up. So instead of uh, really having to rush to get a resume complete, you can kind of just modify it to make sure that it's adequate for that job fair, right? Cool, so hopefully that, uh, that exam gets paid. Um, does anybody uh, have any questions about last lecture? All right, well, I would like to review 4.6 because I find it extremely unlikely that if I gave this as a quiz today that you would all ace it, um, which is fine. It's, uh, it's a very difficult problem. So I want to go over it and do it again, except I have the answer blank here, um, and I want you all to try to remember how it's done. So I don't care how long it takes us to do this. I want everybody to have a really strong understanding because... I will ask again at the end of lecture if you all have an understanding of this C coding stuff, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go through the problem first. All right, let's say you get this on a quiz, not next Tuesday. Um, translate the following C code into MIPS assembly language. All right. You will have access to your green sheet. But for the, for the purposes of this particular lecture, I will serve as your green sheet. Okay. Vowels is an array of words. So words is 32 bits, which means it's MIPS. Okay. Allocated in main, where I is A1. So what is A1? Well, no, what is A1? I, I, let me rephrase. What is A1 in the architecture? Exactly right. It's, it's a register allocated for uh, uh, arguments for a function. The pointer to sum is in A2, J is in A3, and the base address of the array vowels is in A0. And the return address is stored in RA. The address of the first instruction of the while loop is 256. The return the value using B0. And so, the first thing you want to do is you want to go through and actually look at the code and work on it step by step. So we have this while function, and we see that uh, int star vowels, int i, int star sum, and int j 
are the first four. So I've allocated them in order as the compiler would do. So in this case, A0 is vowels, A1 is I, uh, the pointer to sum is A2, and J is in A3, right? Does that make sense? So that, that can help you keep things straight. So the first thing you could do on this problem, my recommendation, the first thing you do before you do anything else is you look up the where the address of the first instruction starts, right? Is it 256? So first thing you do is you write 256 before you do anything else. So then you want to break it down step by step. So the first thing we have is a while loop where vowels i does not equal zero. So in order to write the code for that, what do I need? Okay, so that's okay. So branch not equal is the last thing. Okay, so at some point we're going to need branch not equal. Before I can even branch, what do I need first? What's that? Val's I. I actually need Val's I, right? But more specifically, what, what you said is correct, Jared. Uh, what what do I need? Do I I need the actual physical value of Val's I? Right, so we start out with the reference. Exactly right. We start with the reference. So I need to go from I have the reference to I need the value. So what's the first thing I... So we also know that I have... I here, right? So what do I need to do to I in order to get it to be able to take I plus the reference and get the actual physical value of Val's I? Yes, Travis. Shift left by two. So that's where the reason you say shift left by two is because I specifically state in the problem myth assembly language. MIPS is byte addressing, so we have to multiply by 4 in order to get the <coughs> offset, which means we have to shift left by 2 and store it in a temporary register. So we shift left by 2. So what we're going to do is we have RS and RT. If we look at our MIPS screen sheet, RS is our source register, which is going to be I, which is A1. Our destination register, we can allocate here. We want it to be a temporary value. So here we're going to say T0, and then we're going to shift left by 2. And what I like to do uh, when I was taking this class is I would always add these little comments so I could keep track of which temporary registers were which. So I would say T0 is equal to I times 4. Yes? Is the destination not here before the, um, the A1? Okay, so the way it works, um, if you have your MIPS screen sheet, the way it works is you have, it's an R-type instruction. So it's going to be your opcode, is your RS, RT, and RD, shift them out and function. So let me, for those of you watching on the video later, uh, the question is, why is A1 going here and T0 is going here, right? So the, the way it works is... You have opcode RS, RT, RD, shift amount, and function. So here we have, uh, it's an R type, so it's zero. And then uh, if we look at, uh, forget what's, uh, those, do any of you have your green sheet open? If not, I can just pull it up on Blackboard. Um,
should look logical. It has no elements and large type instruction. And what it says, if you look at it, and I'll, I'll type this out, uh, but you can all refer to it later. What it will say is RD, R of RD is equal to R of RT shift amount, right? So actually what's going on here is RS is just going to be five zeros. RT is going to be A1. And RD is going to be equal to, in this case, T0. Shift amount is going to be 2. And function is on, if you uh, if you recall from when I showed you opcode function in hex, the, fun the function for shift left logical is 0, 0 hex. So a question I got after last lecture. If you could that. The question I got last lecture is, so what happens if I have something like, if it says like 6 hex, right? Some of them say 2, 0 hex. Some of them say 2, 2 hex. If it just says 6 hex, assume it's 0, 6 hex. So then you get 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Does that make sense? So the, to answer your question, this is just the way it was done in... Uh, oh, you're saying... Oh, I see. Wait, I went through this whole spiel. It should be T0... A12, right? Okay. Does that make sense? So basically, you take A1, shift by 2, and it's stored into T0. And I allocated T0 because I'm the compiler driving the micro engine, so I'm allowed to do that. As long as it's consistent, you're fine. So I have my first instruction. Next one. Start adding, you say 257. So I've multiplied I by 4. What's the next thing that I need? You see a lot of people going, ah, yes. Add. And so I want to, I'll call this T1. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say vowels is an A0. And then we're going to say T0. And so it's, now we have T1 is a pointer to vowels of i. So it's pointing to vowels i, but it doesn't have the actual value yet. So then the third instruction is what? No, not branch yet. I only have a pointer. We need to actually, we actually do a load word here. So we do load word, and then I'm going to say t2 here. And what should my offset be for, what should this number be? Zero. Why? Exactly right. So the, what, the, uh, what Mr. Gunter said is the reason why I have T0 is I have cal made a calculation to T1. If you remember my diagram from last lecture, A0 is pointing to the base of vowels, right? T1 when I multiply uh, i by 4, gives me the offset here. So where the this value is pointing to the location in data memory where vowels i is. So I don't, so this is now t1, right? So I don't need another offset. What's actually being done is 0 plus t1 just happens to be there. So now that I have that number, I don't need to add anymore. And then it's going to take this value and store it back in the local faster registers in T2. Yes? What would be the case in which you would not use zero? Like Very good question. If the question read vowels of 4 instead of vowels of i, you could just do this. You do, you do 256 and you can do load word. We'll call it T0. And then it's 4 times 4 because it's byte addressing. So it would be 16 A of 0. But because we do not know I, we cannot guarantee what I will be, we have to do these three steps.
and then I make the notation T2 is equal to vowels of I. Okay, so now I have my vowels of I. Not the weirdest one. Somebody's Lady Gaga's poker face went off for about 10 seconds and they were horrified by my dancing. So that was great because I was like right next to her going, like really getting into it. And then the moment her ringtone went off, I just went right back to lecturing like it was no big deal. Okay, so now I have my vowels I. So now what do I need to do? Branch. Okay, good. So. Branch what? Branch equal because we are doing the opposite of that. Very good. So uh, what are my values going to be here? T2, very good. And dollar sign zero. Why is it dollar sign zero? Stands for zero. Very good. There is a register in... There's a register in MIPS, the very first one, if you look at the bottom right of the front page of the green sheet that has all 32 of those registers, where one of them is allocated to zero. I'm sure some of you remember that from the TGO. And then I always say, I would always like write a little line and leave it blank. The reason why is because we haven't figured out how many instructions we need to branch yet. And then uh, if vowels i does not equal j, branch, and then we'll figure this out. Now, the equation becomes where I'm starting from, or where I get to, which we don't know yet, minus 259 minus 1 times 4. So why is, first and foremost, why is it minus 1? Then remember, I kind of after this we'll we'll be going into the data path design, and you'll understand this a lot better. But why is this? Why am I including this minus one here? <coughs> right. Well, then, then let me go a step further on the question. Um, what you've said is so. Why do I insist on it being the next instruction? What's the physical detail of the computer? that is transparent to the programmer that requires you to do minus one. So here's what happens. You have a program counter. It issues where you are. And then the first thing it does is every time it goes to an adder and increments by four. Because ideally what it would like to do is just do the next instruction and come back, right? But then... If I need to branch more, you have to account for that. That's what's physically there. That's why it's important to understand the difference between computer architecture, which is the code you can manipulate, and computer organization, which are the physical details. Because in this case, you actually have to account for a physical detail that you cannot change. So uh, in, I think I have section five already up. Yeah, it's section five. First thing, program counter goes to the instruction memory and issues the instruction. Then the very next thing, it goes to an adder, adds four. Every time. That's something that you cannot change, so you have to account for it in your code. Does that make sense? All right. Oh. All right, so now we have gotten past our branch. So for our while loop, right? What do we have to do next? We're done here. Yeah, we got to get this if statement taken care of, right? So now we have to think through the logic. We want to do the code if i is less than or equal to j. Which means, when do we not want to do the code? When i is greater than j, right? So here's what's available to us. We have these, this set less than 
and then branch equivalent or, or branch not equivalent, right? So we need to figure out the condition where we can set about set a, uh, set less than, make it one, and then compare it to the zero register. So in this case, we know i is going to be greater than j when we want to branch, which means j is going to be less than i when we want to branch, right? So what we want to do is set our register, temporary register, equal to 1 when j is less than i, right? So set less than, and the first one we're going to put here is, the red, is j, a3, Oh, I'm sorry, the first thing we need to do is, is uh, T3, temporary register, and then in order J, then I. So what I'm saying here in my comment is T3 is equal to 1 if J is less than I. Do you, would you like me all to explain this again? I'm happy to do so. All right, so if i is less than or equal to j, that means that we want to do the code inside the brackets if i is less than or equal to j. We, that means we want to do the code. What we have to determine here is when we do not want to do the code. So it's the opposite, right? So the if i is less than or equal to j, that we do want to do the code, then we do not want to do the code when this is not true. So that occurs only when i is greater than j. Does that make sense so far? So if it were this way, if it was i greater than or equal to j, that we did want to do the code, when, do we, when would we not want to do the code? when i is less than j. Correct. So, so far we got this. So, next thing we need to do is we need to figure out, we, we don't have uh, less, we don't have less than or equal to, and we don't have greater than or equal to, uh, primarily because it would take up a lot more area, and so they're trying to reduce size, and one clock cycle versus the power trade-offs and the side trade-offs, they decided to do this instead. So what we need to do is we need to have, we need to say, have some sort of where we can actually use our branch equivalent or branch not equal, right? So in order to do that, we need to take advantage of this set less than function that we do have available to us, which means we have, we're going to set some register equal to one if, we, if the first variable is less than the second variable. Well, I know that i, in this case, is greater than j, and we have set less than, that's lt. That means we're going to meet this condition if j is less than i, right? So therefore, I want to set less than, and I'm going to allocate a register, in this case, t3, and then the first register I'm going to put here is the one I want to be less than. So I want J less than I. So it's going to be A3, uh, and I is in A1. So if J is less than I, then T3 is going to be equal to 1. And the reason why we're doing this is because if it doesn't meet the condition, then it's going to be 0. And then we can take advantage of our zero register to do either a branch of equal or branch not equal instruction. Yes, uh, questions to start. Are you first then? So you're always going to set something when using it. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, when we use the opposite number of uh, T3, uh, like switch the uh, position of uh, A3 Okay, so I'm actually I'm going to uh, I'll kind of I'm going to do i is greater than or equal to j as an example here in a split second to show to answer that question. The answer to the question is yes. So I'll, I'll show you an example of this in a moment. Okay, so 
we now say that we now have our instance where we know what our what t3 is going to be, right? So t3 is going to be equal to 1 if j is less than i. And t3 is going to be equal to 0 if i is less than or equal to j. Which means we want to branch in this condition. Which means when we choose our next instruction, at the, instruction 261, do we want to branch if, so let me skip past it. So we have t3 and dollar sign 0. And then we're going to have some number of instructions that we're going to jump. Do I want to branch if t3 is equal to 0 or not equal to 0? Not equal to 0, correct? So this is going to be branch not equal t3 and 0. So here's how that works. I get here. I see a. I mean, I, I and J, right? So if <laughs> J is less than I, that means it's not, does not meet this condition, and T3 is going to be equal to 1. Right? And then if T3 is equal to 1, that means it's not equal to 0. Therefore, I want to branch past the brackets, correct? Other condition, let's say that I is in fact less than or equal to j. It's going to say, is j less than i? You're going to say no. That means t3 is going to be equal to 0, correct? Which means when we get here, branch not equal, that means it's going to execute these instructions. So now to answer your question, let's say we can do this, we can say i is greater than or equal to j. So let's walk through the problem again. So if i is greater than or equal to j, that means we are going to branch when i is less than j. Correct? Does everybody see that? So now we can do set less than. We want to say t3 again because we're going to allocate that register. We want to set it true when i, which is a1, is less than j, which is a3. So now we meet that condition when i is less than j, which means I want to branch, right? Which means we can use the same branch not equal here. Another condition, what happens if I say i is greater than j? So if i is greater than j, that means I want to branch when i is not greater than j. When i is less than or equal to j. So one of the things you can do is you can say i is less than j, because this would actually require uh, three lines of code if we did it in a different way. In the kind of, so what you can do is you actually say set less than j is less than i, uh, we'll say t3, a3, and a1, right? So now if we meet the condition, that means we, if, if, if j is less than i, it means we do not want to branch, right? That means branch of equal if t3 is equal to 0. So you can actually use them if you, uh, I forget exactly which topical guide objective it is, but it's uh, the moment I see it, I'll, the moment it decides to scroll up so I can see it. All four possible combinations are listed in TGO 4.6. So there's performance in efficient ways where it requires three lines of code, but I've worked through it and found like the lines of code word is these are the most efficient. And you can either have I or J in this order to get a branch of equal, or, or I or J in this order to get branch not equal, or J or I in the opposite direction to get them equal or not equal. All right, so then same thing, 
uh, branch if uh, branch to uh, if uh, t3 does not equal 0 to minus 261 minus 1 times 4. So I did the same thing. It's uh, 261 here. All right, so far we have gotten in, uh, the branch part. So uh, 262. Now we're actually going to do inside the if statement. So we are. What do we have and what do we need? We need sum, and we already have val xi, correct? So we don't need, if we don't need to reload it uh, yet, or reload or restore. So all we need to do is get a load, and then we're going to allocate yet another temporary register. And this kind of comes back to the question earlier. So we know that if this is our data memory, that a is it a a two is the pointer to these four blocks, which is sum, right? And we're trying to load it into a temporary register. Since we it's pointing directly at it already. We do not need an additional offset, so therefore we are going to have zero A2. So now the T4 is equal to sum. So that star, you see what that star sum, what that pointer actually is physically doing? You all see that now? Yes? Feel free to say no, it's okay. This is like the extra lecture where we're going, we're going over everything. So now that I have sum, and now that I have val xi, right, t2, now I can add them together and put them into this new temporary register. So what I want to do for those, I'm sure you all know plus equals, 263, add, and then t4, t4, and t2. So we can say sum equals sum plus val xi. Does that make sense? So what do I need to do next? What's the nasty thing about pointers? Yeah, exactly right. Every time you change the local copy of a variable that's that, that you're using for a pointer, you have to then store it. Right? So next thing you need to do, 64, store word, T4, 0, A2. And while this may seem uh, not terribly important now, when we get to parallelism at the end of section five, and we start getting into parallelism when you start going into tensilica, uh, maintaining what's known as cache coherence and cache consistency is important. Because if I'm running multiple <laughs> processors and one changes the value of sum and the other processor needs the value of sum, you have to maintain the, the consistency of that variable. So you have to update it immediately. Yes, Henry. Uh, what the problem? What does it say? A2 is it A2. So it's in this order. So A0 is the is a pointer to the base array of vowels. A1 is passed by value of, of i. A2 is a pointer to the address and data memory of sum. And the reason I phrase this question this way is because a concept that has plagued potential computer engineers and computer scientists for years and years and years is why are these two things the same? Even though one of them is pointing to an array and one of them is pointing to an integer. So I wanted you to actually see, using your knowledge of the advanced digital system, what's actually going on there so that we become better coders. All right, so now... I have put the value of vowels back in, so what do I need to do next? Go 
Correct. Well, you do not need to load Valzai because we uh, we don't have we haven't updated Valzai since the last time. So what we need to do is 265, add, and then we have Valzai, which is T2, T2, and then J is A3. Make sense? I need to zoom in a little bit. There we go. So now that we've updated that, that we now know where our first branch location is, right? So that would be we have to branch to instruction 266. So instruction 266 is this I++, right? So we use add immediate. Um, I make that mistake every time I use tab. And so we have to update I. So it's A1, A1, and the immediate value is 1. Since we're going to be branching to 266, we can update this line here by saying 266 minus 261, which is 5, minus 1, which is 4, times 4, which is 20. So this value is now 20. Got a lot of hands went up there. For you, the, um. Um, so we don't have to update, um, about, or we don't have to store about to buy after we've updated it? Oh, yeah, we do. That's correct. Good thing you all have a pen, pencils. Okay, so 266. We are now pointing to Valzai, so we can just do store word. Um, we are Valzai's point. The pointer is T1, right? We haven't updated what what I is, so we don't have to do that. So. Zero. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, T two, zero. T one. So now we're storing. Uh, Valzai. In data memory, which means we're now have to jump to two sixty seven. I mean, sorry, branching to two sixty seven. So this is two sixty seven. Minus two sixty one minus one times four. That's 6 minus 5 times 4. 6 minus 1 is 5 times 4 is 20. Somehow I end up with the right answer. Anyways. Okay, so I'll add my comment here. I plus plus. And so now I know that before I do anything else, before I get to 268, that I, if I'm branching past this while loop, I'm going to 268, right? That's where we're going to start this instruction, which means we can go to 268, minus 159, minus 1. So 268 minus 159 is 9, minus 1 is 8, times 4 is 32. Yes. Can someone explain the answer to this question? Why do I have to store it in data memory? Correct. What? What? It, why? I did update it, but why did I? What specifically about it makes me have to do the store word? It's a pointer to what? Data memory, right? So to answer your question, because <coughs> val's i, you know, so in, in the function declaration it was in star val's, right? So what that means, it's a pointer 
to a location in the physical data memory that any time we change it, we have to update it immediately. So there's a reason why, the, if we recall the top of that objective, there's a difference between pass by value and pass by reference. When I pass something by reference, that means that's a little star, means that I'm pointing to something in the data memory, whereas if it's by <coughs> reference, it's just in the local copy of the registers. So if I'm pointing to the data memory, it means every time I change it, I have to uh, do it a store word. So that's why I had to do it here, because in the problem definition, uh, in the problem definition, I state that sum is a pointer to an integer, right? Same thing, int vals, this is a pointer to the base address of an array. And I've asked the question specifically in this way because you can uh, do, you see how they both look the same? In this case, I'm testing that it's a compiler-driven coding of the micro engine, so that way when the coder is compiling, and those of you who ever, uh, if you ever want to torture yourselves and take a compiler's course, you can see that you actually have to go through and determine if it's an array or not. In this case, you go through, you see that vals is an array, you see that sum is an integer, so you have to do different load store operations. But you have to store every time you update it, and in this case here, in 265, this add operation updated vals of i, right? So I've updated that element of the array, which means I immediately have to update it in data memory. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think I remember um, the first branch being to, or it was like the answer was 36. So I think we're, we might be missing one or two. Did anybody see anything that they appear to, appears to be wrong? I mean, we got sum, right? We've stored the sum, vows of i. We have successfully stored vows i. So it. I don't know. It would be, I just remember it being 36. Okay, well, um, we had to branch past i plus plus. I don't know. It might might be in the case. But we, this. Uh, I'll take a look real quick. Yeah, we had to. We had to. We don't branch past i i plus plus. So it's to be two sixty seven. It should be two sixty eight minus two fifty nine minus one. So that's nine minus one is eight. I don't. I don't see anything uh, obviously wrong at the moment. It might have just been something. That's okay. We'll 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 uh, we'll review again one last time before we move on. Yeah, the what? No, the second, the first, the second y, the first brain. We don't. It's, we skip to the i plus plus at 267. No, no, I don't think you guys are correct. All right, so the two, you guys are uh, the 267. You branch to the i plus plus here, right? So this one here goes to 267. You go to 267, correct? So you don't branch past the i plus plus. The second one you do. You're, you're right. Um, 268 mm -hmm. has a jump. Um, Correct. We haven't, which we have not addressed yet. Okay. Oh, that's yeah, 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 yeah. That was why. There it is. 268 should be jump. 256. This is why you try to do it while simultaneously answering 30 stupid questions. Um, So that begins the while loop, which makes that 36. Okay, so, so now we're at 269. So here's the tricky part. Why do I not update vals i here? In the solution I presented in class, I, I'll let you answer in a second. The solution I presented in class, I didn't do a load word here, which you might be able to justify I, since I updated vals i there. 
So why did I not add a, a load word for Balzai after the while loop? It is already in memory, but why? What specifically about that? That being in memory would be different than because see how it's being updated here in the if statement. Why is it already in memory? You are correct. You, what you've said is so, but why is it? Correct. But I also but I updated the temporary register. But let's say let's say I did this and then went down here, right? That means that's different than the initial value that I uploaded, right? The initial value that's pointing to. Okay, I'm stumping everybody. The reason why is because in order to get up here, right? In order to break the loop, it, I have to use the value that was loaded in here. That means it never gets to this addition, which means this value and this value will be the same. Does that make sense? So what if I did this? What if I did, uh, what would I have to do there? Yeah, you have to update. You have to do the whole shift left logical. You have to temp create a temporary register where you would add I plus one. And then you would have to shift left logical then load word, oh, add, then load word. But yeah, I've already tested you on that concept, so adding, asking twice is redundant. Yes, Jerry? I'm afraid it's probably that question. Why don't you have a jump in the one jump you that the first branch? Oh, no, okay. So that the, you do not, you need a jump when you need to go backwards. The if statements, the only, you're not, if you hit here, you're never, there's never going to be a situation where you go back. So the branch is only, I want to go, uh, think of it this way. Branches, if I want to go this way, uh, only, towards the end of the code. Jump means I want to go back one line. Like, because ultimately you want, you have to, if you remember Turing completeness from, uh, I mean, if you have me through Zoom, you all know what Turing complete means? All right. I'm not going to go into a whole lecture of what Turing complete means, but at some point, if you write a Turing complete program, it means you have to be able to guarantee that your code will finish. So you have to be able to continually progress. Jump means that you're going to be jumping back to a certain point to complete a loop. All right, so um, now that we know what uh, we can guarantee that we don't need to load uh, I again here, we need to... Add plus e, I. Uh, we can actually do this. We don't even need that plus equals. We turn I plus vowels, right? So in this case, um, what we're going to do here is we're going to add. And what's our register that we're going to uh, return in? From the pre from the problem statement, and this is the last part. Return the value using v zero. So we're going to store it in v0, so it's available when we go back to when we get back to main, and then we're going to add i, which is a1, and then we're going to add val's i, which I believe was t2. And so what's, what do we need to do next? And before anybody answers, this is the single most common student mistake on an exam, on a quiz, the next step. Yeah, we have to get back, we have to get back to the main function, right? So this is a function that was called. So your last line of code, no matter what, is going to be a function, right? And I'm going to tell you in the problem statement, I, I will guarantee you that the problem statement will say somewhere, and the return address is stored in register RA. So the last thing you should say is jump register. RA. 
The most common mistake on the on the exams in the past has been leaving that line off. So I didn't, also I should state because this is another thing I get often. Uh, I will not. I do not require you to write all these comments. I I include that merely as a that is something when I was learning how to do this and trying to make sure that I didn't make silly mistakes on exams. I thought that was a very good way of keeping track of everything. So does anybody have uh, any questions about this? Yes, I Okay, so uh, yesterday you said something about students in Clever and like reusing temporary registers. Okay. Where exactly would... Okay, so in this case, you see how T0 is just I times 4, and I never use it again? Sometimes students will do this. That's fine as long as, you know, here it says T1. As long as you do that there, uh, any other time where it says T1. Uh, for those of you watching at home, uh, the question is, when students want to try to get clever with uh, register reuse, um, how would you go about that? And so that is one such example. Did I get all the instances of T1? Yeah. Yes? Does that actually help the It doesn't necessarily help the efficiency. However, uh, what it does help is that you can only, there are only so many registers available to you. So if you're writing a, so this, is a this is a good type problem because it tests everything I need to test. And it doesn't require that much code, so it doesn't take too much time on an exam. But if you're writing a much larger piece of code with multiple functions, uh, multiple, with a large main, um, how do you actually, with parent and child functions, which you'll learn about when we go into Tensilica programming, uh, you need to have a very efficient use of this to make sure you don't have to get into too much operating system swapping of, of, uh, in, the, in the cache memory, the data memory. So to uh, go a little bit further, um, you you now know a little bit about how we have to do this, you know, direct and set associativity to be able to have a certain amount. We know that each uh, level of cache is smaller, but it's faster but more expensive. So we want to try to use that, take advantage of the principles of locality to swap things as to use the, as many registers as possible. So to answer your question, it does not improve performance until you have to start swapping out because you haven't uh, used your registry properly. Also, you know how you, uh, you're you recommended to restart your Windows machine because about once a day because it'll start slowing down? The reason why is because poorly written programs that don't properly take advantage of these registers will just say, all right, I'm going to allocate that register just like we have here, right? Just like we're doing here. And then don't deallocate it. So then every time you swap it out, you have to do more and more swapping, which means that you're, uh, over the course of the day, your computer is going to slow down just because it doesn't have as many resources available to it. So what they recommend is you turn your computer off. Part of the operating system, it says, all right, all the pointers are gone. The registers are free to be used. And that's why when you restart it, after it does all the startup uh, programs, it's typically running a lot faster because of that. All right, so what I'm going to do um, for this, what I, would, what I would like you all to do is, so you have this problem available to you. This while, oh, that's too far. What I would like you to do, and this one was less than or equal to, right? I want you to come up with four variants of this problem. And such as, for example, you could say one of them would be, I'm going to do this problem, except it's going to be i greater than j. Right? Or equal, equal to zero. Change four things in this problem. So you can say i, i equals equal to zero, i is less than j. You say minus equals, and then you could add i plus one, for example. Change four things about this problem and attempt it yourself.
Yes. Is it like? No, I want. Okay, so I'm sorry. I should be clear about it. I want one problem with four changes, not four different problems. I, I realized I worded it weird. Yeah. What was the while loop originally? It was originally val's i does not equal zero. And this was originally less than or equal to j. This was originally plus equals. And this was originally, yeah, that's that was uh, j. Change, uh, I should make a, lim a limitation, change um, either something that would require you to do a uh, shift, like, you know, instead of saying j, like j plus 1, right? That would require you to do something completely different. Don't do this. Don't do um, i is less than or equal to i or something silly like that, right? So make four changes to one problem and submit it. Yeah, that's that. That's that. Oh well, no, we you guys we did four point six for the homework you just submitted. What I want you to do is I want you to look at this original problem, change four things about it, and then reattempt the problem on your own. That is your homework assignment that's due on Tuesday. Yes, I will post this video. Absolutely. All right, in that case, uh, you are dismissed. <laughs>